note that the session will be recorded. Um, I imagine uh, Sarah is, uh, has just hit record um, and we will be sharing that recording. So the recording and the presentations will all be shared on the INE website after this webinar. Um, so you'll be able to find them there and, and share them with any colleagues who might not be able to join us this morning. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, Hannah, if you could just move us to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the fourth webinar in INEE's COVID-19 webinar series. And the focus today is providing um, psychosocial support and socio-emotional socio learning support for learners during COVID-19. Our webinar series, um, all the recordings you can find on, um, on our website, including last week's webinar, which focused on distance learning. And as I say, this recording will be shared there as well. The sort of goal of the webinar series is really to, to bring the EIE community together around some of these key issues and challenges we're facing in our work um, in the current um, global pandemic. Um, and PSSSCL was raised by many of you as a real priority area, and that's why we wanted to focus on that today. Um, before we get started, I am just going to ask to hand over to our director here at INEE, Dean Brooks, to do a more formal welcome for us today. Um, Dean, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And uh, thank you, everybody that's on today's webinar. Um, as Charlotte's mentioned, this is one of a series of webinars based on feedback from our membership. Um, and I would just, you know, like to acknowledge that we are now weeks into this crisis and it is actually time to really um, be looking at our programs and the psychosocial support that we are uh, seeking to foster and, and build upon um, and the social emotional learning aspects. Um, I'd also like to take uh, a moment to just really acknowledge uh, the immense effort uh, that our colleagues here, our panelists, as well as all of you in the EIE community are taking to ensure the continuity of education. As we know, um, it's, it's really key and the, the PSS SEL component is a big part of that. And finally, just to really emphasize the importance of, of taking care of yourselves so that you can deliver these programs and taking care of each other. Um, very excited to hear our panelists today and, and learn from them in a number of contexts. Uh, some real experts today, and we appreciate them all taking time out uh, to share with the wider INEE community. So thank you, Charlotte. I'll hand back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Dean. Okay, so we're going to get started shortly. Um, and you may, yeah, maybe just to say, my name's my name's Charlotte, um, and um, I'll be moderating the, the webinar today in this webinar series. But I also wanted to give a huge thanks to the INE team behind the scenes um, who are making all of this possible. And also a huge thanks to our panelists and our working group members um, who are um, playing such an important role in this webinar series. And last but not least, to all of you, our wonderful participants. So thanks again for joining us today. Hannah, if we could move to the next slide, I'll just, just give you an overview um, of what we'll be doing today. So we're going to begin with an overview and framing around PS and S, PSS and SEL at this time. And I'll hand over shortly um, to my colleague, um, Rachel Smith here at INEE. We're then going to have a series of, of short presentations from a range of, of perspectives and contexts. So we'll start with two presentations focusing on how we're adapting our work around PSS and SEL at the moment. Firstly, an organizational perspective from Randa at IRC, and then from a, a programming perspective in country from um, Shafi and from Creative Associates in Afghanistan. We'll then hear two presentations that will highlight some really um, um, important new resources that might be of use to colleagues on the webinar. Um, so we'll have uh, Marion from Save the Children will share tips for parents and caregivers. And then that will be followed by Andrea and Khaloud um, with games and activities for children and families. Um, and then last but not least, we'll have two presentations really helping us think about the different actors involved in this effort at this time. So parents and caregivers and teachers um, from Allison at PLAN. Um, and then um, Barbara from the University of Geneva um, will um, share some real insight around higher education at this time as well. So hopefully a real range of perspectives and useful approaches and resources for us all today to hear from. As I say, they'll be quite quick presentations, but that will give us plenty of time for a moderated discussion. Um, so please do submit those questions um, and we'll make sure to hear more from our panelists um, in the discussion section of our webinar. 
So that's the plan for today, um, but I won't take up any more time. Let's get started. Um, I'm going to hand over to my, my colleague, Rachel. Rachel is our PSS and SEL um, program manager here at i &E, and she's just going to give us a, a framing for the discussion today. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Some of you on this call will be very experienced with PSS and SEL. You might be education specialists or advisors who are very familiar with this field. But others of you might, for the first time, be looking for ways to integrate PSS and SEL into your current programming. But regardless of your familiarity with PSS and SEL, we are all here because of the unique set of challenges brought about by COVID-19. We are all hoping to learn from one another and to help us feel our way through this uncharted territory. So I believe we all stand to learn something from our fantastic panelists who just like you are trying to find new ways to support students when we aren't able to gather them in schools or in learning spaces as we were before. Um, if you are very new to PSS and SEL, I'd like to flag three resources at the top of this webinar. Um, thanks. So we have, uh, INEE has developed three resources um, that you might be familiar with already. Um, we have a guidance note on PSS and SEL, a background paper and um, a training module. All three of these resources are available on our website and um, they're also they're linked to in this slide deck so when you get this after the webinar you'll be able to just click below the resource to access them um, and they're available in Arabic, French, Spanish, Portuguese as well as English. Um, I'd also like to flag that we have a dedicated MHS and um, MHPSS collection of resources on the COVID-19 resource collection on the INE website. Um, in short, though, when we talk about psychosocial support, we're talking about the processes and actions which promote holist holistic well-being. And social and emotional learning refers to the processes that foster the development of five competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship building and responsible decision making. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please, Anna. Thank you. Um, so why, why is it particularly important that we prioritise the well-being of students at this time? Or in why do we need to focus on developing these competencies like self-management or social awareness? As most of you are very aware by now, nearly 90% of the world's student population are out of school, meaning that nearly 90% of the world's students are facing a loss of learning, a loss of routine, isolation from their friends, uncertainty about the future, as well as concerns about the virus itself, including threats to their own health and the health of loved ones. As we know, for some children and young people, school is much safer than home. So the removal of this protective environment has vast implications beyond only a disruption to learning. So children and young people are facing multiple new sources of stress and the need to support and cope with this stress and build resilience is paramount at the moment. Psychosocial support and social and emotional learning can facilitate and foster this resilience. So what we mean by that is resilience is meaning the capacity to cope with stress and adapt to challenges. Resilience happens when protective factors that support well-being are stronger than the risk factors that cause harm. And if we could go to the next slide. So just to frame your listening um, of the panelists of the upcoming presentations, I'd like to highlight some key considerations. The first one is to learn from what we already know. So while we can acknowledge that we've never faced a crisis quite like this before, crises are not new to anyone in the humanitarian sector you are some of the best placed professionals to demonstrate the importance of that resilience I mentioned. So to cope with stress and adapt to change. And it's this adaptation of existing tools and resources which will be key in our responses. As Charlotte said, you're going to hear 
later on from some of our panelists about how they're adapting their programming. Um, we can utilize our existing knowledge and skills to meet this challenge. And when I say we, I mean the wider network of EIE professionals and practitioners. Um, now is a perfect time for us to learn from one another and share our expertise. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are all on this webinar. The second consideration is the support needed for, for parent well-being and teacher well-being. So as we considered during our well-being webinar a couple of weeks ago, we're not able to support others if we don't take care of ourselves first. We need to acknowledge that parents are playing multiple roles in their children's lives right now, and on top of which they are affected by stress and trauma of the crisis. Likewise, some teachers have to continue going into work, putting themselves at risk in order to continue providing education. And we know that when schools reopen, teachers will be at the forefront of providing PSS to students and having the added pressure of closing educational gaps, which will have inevitably emerged. Some of our other presenters are going to speak more to that later about how we can support parents and caregivers. Third, I want, to, I want us to bear in mind the importance of centering equity and inclusion in our responses. In the humanitarian sector, we know that the virus is not this great equaliser, as some would have us believe. We know that it does disproportionately affect those who are already marginalised. So having to adapt programming towards distance learning measures also provides us with an opportunity to reach those who were already excluded from learning environments before the onset of the virus. When we centre those who are more readily excluded, it can make our services as accessible as possible. The final consideration is the importance of coordination with the health and the child protection actors. If you're familiar with the top tier of the MHPSS intervention pyramid, I want us to think about those referral mechanisms um, to the specialised services at the top, where children and young people are in need of additional support. So thank you once again for joining us today. I'm going to hand back to Charlotte, who will introduce the first panellist. Great, thanks so much, um, Rachel. Really helpful framing for us there as we, as we delve now into more detail in the presentations. Um, but without much further ado, I think let's get started. I'm, I'm really grateful to be joined by a fantastic um, panel today. And we're gonna start by hearing from Randa at IRC um, about how they're adapting um, their work around social emotional learning um, in the COVID-19 response. Um, so thank you, Randa, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. okay, great. Thanks so much, Charlotte, and also Rachel. That was um, a really good introduction. So uh, I'm going to jump straight into it. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, an overview of how IRC as an organization is tackling, adapting our programs, especially our social emotional learning programs for this response um, to COVID-19. and. Um, and there are a few things I think that were just are just helpful to share as, as things to consider while you're starting this process or perhaps you're already in this process. But um, the first thing being that we we really wanted to um, be cognizant of the national efforts that are already happening, um, either from other NGOs or um, uh, from ministries of education and generally like governments as a response. Uh, for, um, as they try to um, as they try to maintain continued learning or programs for continued learning. So, whatever our response is going to be, we wanted to make sure that it was going to be working. It was going to complement these national efforts. If we can perhaps, you know, even um, uh, piggyback onto certain efforts. And there was a specific need for social emotional learning and PSS. Um, um, from from their like from their request, so we know that there is a gap area a lot of the time in this area. So we we were happy to fill it, um, and so that's maybe one one thing to consider. The other thing is uh, we tried to identify some of the major areas of focus of how we want to proceed. So obviously, like already mentioned, we want to make sure that children get access to SEL material or SEL uh, curricula. Um, some of the topics we want to focus on are obviously positive coping skills, stress relief, but also maintaining a sense of control. Like how can you feel in these circumstances that they're 
you still have a sense of control over um, your own life, your own uh, decisions. And so there are ways to do that. Um, and then we also wanna make sure that caregivers and community are engaged. Um, and that there's, um, that teachers are also being integrated in some format. And once you select your areas of focus and understand what are the priorities for you in a programmatic level, then you can go deeper into the program adaptation. So something that we were challenged with the program adaptation is this tension between deciding first what, what content we're going to have and then how we're going to deliver it, what the channel is going to be. So, um, so you might experience this tension, but I think it's going to vary program to program because if you're already working with a Ministry of Education that has an existing curriculum and content that they want to deliver, then you know that you have that what first and then you have to think about the viable channels of delivery in order to reach people at home and uh, without perhaps without skilled facilitators. Um, and then if you're working perhaps more on a non-formal setting or something to do with early childhood development, like we are with um, the Ellen Simpson program and collaboration with Sesame Workshop, we had already started um, thinking about channels of delivery. They had already been testing and piloting digital messaging, for example. So, um, so we started first thinking about uh, what the viable channels of delivery are and then thinking about the content that we want to uh, provide. So that's generally been our approach and then when you find the content we've really been trying to make sure to listen to what the needs are and not create and over create content without, um, without when we don't even know if that's a gap area because so many organizations are producing new content that our, our main priority was to think okay, how could we, like, what content do we already have that could just work or be quickly adapted as is? And then whatever we don't have, we can fill that gap either by creating new content or by sourcing it from the outside. Um, and then for the channels of delivery, just like Rachel mentioned, I'm not gonna repeat it too much, but you do wanna make sure that any combination of channels of delivery that you have is reaching the most vulnerable and the ones who have the least access to content. So we can um, switch slides. Yeah, so I, I also wanted to give you just a quick um, overview of what are some criteria you could think about when curating SEL content for this response. Um, we work on, on a really global level, so we want to, uh, like we in the IRC, so we wanted to make sure that whatever we select could try to apply to as many regions or as many countries as possible. Um, and so that's one thing to approach it with. On the other hand, you can also start from the bottom up where the countries themselves are producing the content or have it already. Um, and it might work on a regional level depending on what language it is. So we really want obviously something with simple instructions, perhaps with visual aids so that it could complement people who, uh, it could complement um, having not very much backup support to people doing it alone at home. Um, so minimal dependence on trained facilitation materials also because we don't know if we're going to be able engage with, to engage with through teachers um, to reach children. So you might just be delivering that straight to the home. Um, and also regarding materials, our context varies so much and some, some households will prefer to want to use household materials or even more sophisticated materials, but others um, might not. Um, so we will really want to create a balance there. Um, if you can find activities that are cross-cutting for ages that are going to be done by families, it's going to be better if those activities can accommodate involving parents or older or younger siblings. Um, so yes, we do want age-specific content, but at this time it might even be smarter to start with content that involves more family members because it's more likely to be um, absorbed. Um, and then reusable and extendable, what I mean by this is that you want content that you don't want content that needs to be refreshed all the time, but rather something that can be part of a daily practice or a routine, um, like journaling. Um, it could also be something like social emotional learning kernels, so little practices that can be done every day. So those are short bite-sized activities. So we do want them to be modular. Um, that means that they don't have to fit into a larger sequence. We're not really working with a large academic curriculum anymore preferably standalone activities, but we're also being asked about um, longer activities that can fill out more time of the day because children are, don't have much to do. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, so I wanted to give you guys just a, a quick look um, at what we are doing right now. So IRC is now in this process of collecting and curating content. So as a part of our immediate phase or immediate response approach, we are first looking at existing content 
And then, uh, like I said, this is all based on the, the, we want the feedback and we want the, the actual needs identification from um, country programs that are rolling this out. Um, so we've created sort of an online database um, that categorizes all of the content. So I'm sorry if it's a little bit fuzzy, but um, the names there of the, we have first, like we've categorized them into uh, IRC resources and then external resources and then general resources that we can find uh, outside and um, country specific response plans. So um, I would say that it's been really helpful to categorize it this way because then anyone from our organization can go into it to search for what they want by, by age, by subject, so PSS or SEL, um, by, uh, by grade level because sometimes that doesn't match up what the ages are. Um, and also how long the activity is or how long it might take. And anyone can contribute a resource um, and it's going to be sort of assessed at a, on, like for quality on, at a central database. And we're starting this on an internal level, but we're hoping that some of these once identified as really useful could be shared externally. So um, if so, please look out for them um, on the PSS and SEL IME website. Um, I think that's it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, please let me know. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Randa. I think we yeah, are really helpful to hear sort of that organize, organizational perspective of how you're approaching and adapting um, in these challenging times um, related to this particular issue. So, so huge thanks for sharing that. And I imagine that sort of, yeah, content and delivery um, model question is one everyone is grappling with. So really appreciate you highlighting that. Thank you. So we're now going to take a look at, at what what does this mean, this, this kind of uh, thinking about how we're adapting our, our work around PSS and SEL in, in a particular program, in a particular context. context. And I'm really grateful um, to have Shafi Rahimi on the line um, from Afghanistan, um, from Creative Associates. And, and Shafi's going to be, be sharing their experience adapting their um, programming um, in light of, of, the, of COVID-19. Um, fingers crossed um, connectivity is okay. Shafi, can we ask you to, to come off mute and, and uh, share um, your experiences with us? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. Uh, good morning, everyone, and nice meeting you all virtually. I'm glad to be here today and share field experiences and examples from Afghanistan. I would like to start with a quick uh, overview of uh, the project as a background. Afghan Children Radio is a USAID funded early grade reading quality education reform project aiming to improve children's learning outcomes in grades one to three in both public schools, by public schools I mean uh, government run schools, and community-based education class is uh, and working in partnership with the Ministry of Education of Afghanistan and five pilot provinces of the country. Uh, the project has a numerous uh, elements, including teaching learning materials development uh, for early grades, training of teachers to equip them with required skills to teach new early grade reading curriculum and ensure continuous professional development and support for teachers through coaching and mentoring, uh, research, uh, organizational capacity development, and social mobilization for other elements, major elements of the program. More specifically about SEL, Afghanistan has, as we all know, Afghanistan has a long history of conflict and particularly with the current ground realities of ongoing conflict in many parts of the country. Teachers and students have been constantly exposed to stressful situations. So therefore, the project considered the social emotional learning as a cross-cutting theme across all elements of the early grade reading model and project uh, interventions holistically. Uh, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Here I'm going to discuss uh, how HCL social emotional learning was uh, integrated into different elements of uh, the project. First, I would like to start with the curriculum. Uh, the project in partnership with the Ministry of Education introduced new early grade reading uh, curriculum in Afghanistan from grade one to grade three. 
while we were developing the new books and the new curriculum for early grade reading, a set of eight year related uh, competences identified and integrated with slight difference between grades one and two and grade uh, three. And grade one and two each week had specific ACL objectives. Uh, lessons are designed to include activities that allow children to develop and practice ACL skills. And grade three, more time is available for children to explicitly focus on building ACL skills through uh, literacy lessons. Uh, Moving to teacher training and teachers' professional development. Under teachers' professional development, we have three components, pre-service, and service coaching, and mentoring. Many teachers in Afghanistan has no or very less information and knowledge about social and emotional learning uh, since we have not been witness of such a formal training for teachers. Uh, less attention has been paid to this specific area. Therefore, in order for teachers to gain theoretical knowledge what SEL means and to master necessary skills and strategies for incorporating SEL into practice while teaching new curriculum with SEL aspects, so SEL was integrated uh, in the end service training, end the training, coaching and mentoring, uh, and also other teachers' professional related activities. Each training include a module on SEL, and the teachers' guides also include guidance on developing positive classroom environment for children. A little bit more about pre-service part. As part of uh, the project support for development of an early grade reading diploma course for teachers to be used in teacher training colleges, the project was requested by Afghan Ministry of Education for developing three of uh, four courses focused on uh, early grade reading. However, based on Ministry of Education observations of the project activities in the field and how ACL was integrated, we were requested to, to have the fifth course, Social Emotional Learning Skills for Early Grade Students. That is part of uh, the primary diploma for teacher training colleges. With the social mobilization and uh, parental engagement, uh, so uh, social mobilization is also one of the important elements of the project. Uh, over the course of the project implementation, if you worked with the school management shuras, uh, school management shura is a structure which has members from community, from school, and uh, also in, in certain cases, uh, school principal is also a member of the school management uh, shura. So uh, the project worked with them, build their capacity to work closely with communities and parents and strengthen mode of cooperation and coordination among communities, parents and schools. Mainly support school shuras was focused on two major areas, uh, the formal training on community activity guide uh, and also awareness raising, which was further complemented by series of school level and community level awareness raising uh, sessions. Given uh, the emergency response and uh, I will also provide you with an example from Nangrahar province, which is in the east of Afghanistan, which is border with Pakistan. Afghanistan, also like other countries of the world, uh, is facing the challenge of the life training COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and the situation is even worse, as you all know, than other parts of the world with very poor health services. Uh, political tensions, ongoing conflict, uh, which significantly affected the education sector right at the time while children were preparing to start the new academic year. In these difficult times of the crisis and uh, with the Ministry of Education decision that schools will remain closed across the country and we, we all do not know when the children will be back and schools will be open. So children are currently at home. Uh, this year, uh, support the school management for us. Those for us who were part of our program and they were uh, trained uh, 
it started an initiative in Nangrahar province. The initiated a campaign uh, to raise educational awareness and encourage families to create a supportive learning environment for their children, particularly children in early grades to study their school subjects at home. This initiative would not only help families to gain a better understanding, about importance of education, but also reminds them about the important role of parents to support and enhance their children learning at home. Uh, consistent with the Ministry of Public Health guidance and instructions uh, not to spread the virus, they use different innovative channels for dissemination of uh, messages, including phone calls to parents, text messages, sending letters, and working with imams. Uh, Masjid imams and religious scholars to spread the message through mosques loudspeakers and using mosque loudspeakers uh, the prayer times by themselves. I, by themselves, I mean by school management shuras to convey messages about prevention of coronavirus and the importance of staying home and children education. Uh, as we all know, uh, that uh, losing a routine, particularly when kids were preparing to go to school in a week before school's closure uh, started, can cause stress and anxiety. And these efforts by Shoros is encouraging families to establish some normalcy for children and keep families connected to uh, uh, each other and also they're they're doing these things with uh, strictly keeping in mind all safety measures including social and physical distancing uh just to summarize uh each year is now taking the experience from nangrahar province because we are working in five uh, major provinces of the country as pilot provinces and working with kushras and other provinces to replicate it this example clearly signals how Shoras empowered and understood uh, the lack of normalcy and routine was difficult for children and parents. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I put a few quotes from a child and also a parent about their experience that I will read. Uh, Yosin is a grade three uh, student uh, from a village in Bisu district of Nagrahar province. He says that his parents have been supportive in helping his brothers and, or brother and sisters uh, with schoolwork. His father has shared messages he learned about coronavirus protection uh, through school management shuras. Yasin also adds that when schools reopen, uh, he will aim to bring his learning uh, at home back into classroom. Uh, another quote is from a parent. Uh, from Shergar Dog Village uh, in the Koma districts, which is also in Nangrahar province, stated that he has developed a schedule for his children, which includes time for reading and writing, and also helping them with exercises at home together with other members of the family. There are so many examples of great work uh, school management shores are doing uh, under this initiative in Nangrahar province. Due to time limitation, I will not be able to share all those examples. I will conclude here my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shafi. I think we could have, um, yeah, I would have loved to have heard from you for much longer, but we'll we'll definitely um, pick up again in the in the discussion um, later on in the session. Um, but thank you. I think yeah, so helpful to hear how those adaptations could take place and uh, really building on that, um, the community structures and, and efforts. So um, thank you. Um, brilliant. Thank We're now going to, to change over um, to, to look at some um, tools and resources that have been produced and are available um, on the INE website that may be, be useful for participants' work and colleagues' work. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to um, Marion from um, Save the Children, who's um, kindly going to share one of those resources with us. Marion, over to you. Thanks, Charlotte, and hi, everyone. Really pleased to be with you here today. Um, I'm sharing a very brief um, tool uh, that we've developed um, over the last couple of weeks weeks which is providing tips for parents and caregivers um, relating to the um, COVID school closures um, supporting children's well-being and learning um, and 
the, the idea to develop these tips was partly motivated actually by my own experience as a parent working at home with small children affected by school closures. I'm based in Denmark and the schools have been closed for um, five weeks now. And it, it felt and it feels quite overwhelming, especially not knowing how long schools will be closed at the beginning. Um, and I, we looked around and we saw that various organizations had developed guidance on parenting in the time of COVID, um, as well as great resources on explaining the virus um, itself to children. Um, and there are a plethora of um, learning resources available as well from, from government and other sources. But we didn't find anything that really focused on the impact, the, the mental impact, the psychological impact of school closures specifically, and how to support children's well-being and learning at home. Um, and also, of course, not forgetting the, the well-being of parents and caregivers who are um, trying to support them. Um, so we developed this, this short uh, few page um, tip sheet. It's been developed by um, Save the Children um, colleagues across the, across the movement, as well as um, colleagues from the MHPSS Collaborative, which is a bit like INEE. It's an interagency platform that's focused on the MHPSS um, needs of children and families in adversity. Um, so like Rachel um, reminded us at the beginning, uh, we worked across sectors on, this, on these tips. So some of us coming from an education background, but others who really specialize in child protection and others who are specializing in mental health and psychosocial support. And we came together to bring, to bring our experience um, to, one, to one document. And the tip sheet covers um, four sets of key messages. Um, and the first set of messages is, is first to help parents and caregivers explain to children why schools are closed. What is the link between schools closing and helping to prevent the, the spread of the virus? And also guidance on how to deal with questions that, that children may have on that, as well as what children themselves can do to help stop um, the virus spreading while they are out of school. Then the second um, set of key messages talks about coping strategies relating to school closures. So how can parents support children manage their stress, um, manage um, behavior relating to school closures? Um, behavior may change because of the disruption in routine and so on, but also how um, uh, parents and caregivers can care for can care for themselves and keep themselves healthy in this um, stressful time. The third set of um, messages talks about how children can keep learning at home. And this guidance isn't a kind of how to in terms of um, academic teaching or, um, you know, key um, uh, yeah, knowledge or skills um, specific to any curricula. It more emphasizes how parents and caregivers can support learning um, and, and recognizing what parents and caregivers already have, the resources that they already bring um, as teachers to their children, um, emphasizing you don't have to be a trained teacher to support um, children's learning at home and, and recognizing the capacities and the agency that parents and caregivers already have and also what the children already have, that they are often geared up for learning and they learn naturally if, if they're allowed to, to play and, and develop at home safely. And then finally, um, there are some tips on how to prepare children for the reopening of schools. This is a phase where some families are already, already there in, around the world. Um, and we're also aware that it might not be a linear progression of, of reopening that in some contexts schools might close and then reopen again. So how can we prepare children for those scenarios and talk about reopening? Um, so th these, uh, this guide is available, um, we've shared it with INEE as well as the ISC MHPSS reference group and it's available in Arabic, English, French and Spanish and at the moment it's a, a written document and available on those websites um, but we're also working on some sample scripts to turn these key messages um, uh, into uh, short scripts that could be used for example on the radio. Um, so thinking about different ways that we could dis disseminate these messages um, and to complement or add to what um, governments or other learning providers are, are sharing with families and children um, focused on more traditional academic content. 
Um, so in addition to these key messages, um, there are also six really simple examples of activities that parents and caregivers could practice at home with their children that support their social emotional skills development. And if we just go on to the next slide. Um, thanks. Then this is um, this is an example of one um, one of the activities that we have on the sheet and i'm actually going to ask if you don't mind that to that we can um practice it ourselves i think experiencing it is one of the best ways to kind of feel um feel feel and experience and then um, we'll know um how better be able to share um the kinds of activities that are in the in the tip sheet so this um, exercise is called belly breathing and we explain to parents or caregivers it's something to help children but also help ourselves as adults feel calm. So I'm going to ask us to all try it together now. It's very simple. All you need to do is, is sit up a little bit straight in front of your, your Zoom screens, your computers, sit up relaxed and you can close your eyes if you'd like to and you can put your hands gently on your bellies, on your stomach. And I just ask you to breathe in slowly and feel your belly fill up with air. Your belly should get nice and round and now breathe out. And you can feel your belly get small again, slowly. Then you breathe in again. One, two, three, four, five, and out again. Five, four, three, two, one. Breathe in again. One, two, three, four, five, and out again. Five, four, three, two, one. Now you can slowly open your eyes and breathe normally. How are you feeling? If you do that with a child, you can first ask how they're feeling and share with them how, how the belly breathing made you feel too. It's a really simple exercise, not hard to do at all, um, but it helps children and of course us as well, adults, practice a key social emotional skill relating to self-management, one of the five categories um, that was talked about at the beginning of the presentation. And for children, it also relates to an executive, fu executive functions um, because it asks children to practice following instructions and controlling their bodies in time with, with the words. So that was just one example of, of some of the very um, simple activities we have on this sheet. We can go, now go to the, my last slide. I wanted to talk really briefly about um, how we can provide mental health and psychosocial support during COVID and give some practical concrete examples. But I first wanted to, to, to speak about why we are talking about not just psychosocial support, PSS, but also mental health and MHPSS. Um, why is that important for us as education actors? I think for, for some education practitioners and myself included, um, it can feel quite intimidating to think about mental health and psychosocial support. And we may not feel always qualified to be thinking and talking about it. Um, and we're aware that the COVID-19 um, epidemic is a massive global health emergency, um, but I think we're also very aware that um, it's also potentially a mental health emergency. Um, and that edu as education experts, we need to be thinking not only about how we can support children to continue learning, but how we can support their well-being and mental health, health given the disruptions. And so um, the foundational framework for well-being that's used in humanitarian contexts is what's called the MHPSS pyramid, which is um, on my slide there. It's very small, um, but hopefully you can look at it when we send the presentation round. And it explains how we all need access to services to support our well-being. Um, along the bottom layer, um, all of us need the provision of basic services such as shelter or a safe classroom, for example. Um, Many of us need community and family supports to feel well. That might be a teacher or a caregiver who's aware of how to support well-being and recovery. And I'm sure a lot of the programs we're hearing about today really focus on that, um, that layer of the pyramid. Um, 
Others might need more focused support from trained professionals like social workers or healthcare providers. And then a small number of adults or children will need more specialized clinical care, so the top layer of the pyramid. Um, so it's important for us as education practitioners practitioners to be aware of what we can do to support well-being and also what we cannot do, what we might need to be aware of in order to ensure that children and their care caregivers are referred to services further up the pyramid. So linking um, people that we're working with um, to child protection and health actors. How can we work together with those other actors to meet the well-being needs of all children, no matter what interventions they need, where they are on the pyramid? it um, so that's that's why we think in this um, in this way of linking MH and PSS and and the role that education actors play so I'll end very briefly and I can talk more about some of these examples in the Q&A because I know my my time is nearly up but some examples of how say the children's staff and partners have continued to provide MH PSS in the in the context of COVID um, just some quick um, ideas. Hotlines have been available. Um, for example, some of our partners working in Uganda are providing um, hotline numbers with different languages and staff who are trained on providing emotional support and linking children and fam families to necessary services are manning those hotlines. And they themselves, those staff, are then provided with support and supervision, which is a key element of quality MHPSS. Um, we can do time targeted um, calling and texting. So a lot of our child protection actors um, and, and staff are doing remote case management. So following up with families and children um, via phone. We are providing supplies. So individual kits with recreation materials, activity cards, illustrated tips like the ones we've, we're sharing today um, are being distributed to families and children in particular need. And where possible um, and where safe uh, and where the priority is, is needed, there, there might be um, some face-to-face -face support provided um, where um, social workers or MHPSS professionals with the appropriate um, uh, kit um, and following social distancing rules might visit children and families um, face to face as well. So just some concrete ideas, happy to talk about any more of those during the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks so much, Marianne. Um, yeah, always powerful to, to be reminded of these things in practice. And, and those last points you raised, um, definitely we've been receiving a lot of questions for these, looking for these types of examples. So it'd be great to come back to that in the Q&A. Thank you so much um, for bringing the, that MHPSS perspective for us and, and this useful resource. I'm going to hand quickly over, I'm conscious of time, um, to our colleagues at Right to Play, Andrea and Khalud, who are going to share with us a, another resource recently available um, on the website, um, on the INE website in our collection, and this focusing on games and activities for, for children and families. Um, so over to you guys. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, can you hear me and see me? We can hear you well, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. Hi everybody, um, I'm Andrea uh, from the Toronto office in, at Right to Play and I'm joined by my colleague in Palestine, Khulud Salami, who will speak in just a moment. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Right to Play specializes in using play-based approaches to support various outcomes, including psychosocial well-being. But traditionally, we are not first responders. Uh, we work in protracted refugee crises, crises or with refugees, but not first response. And around a month ago, we came together, uh, several country offices, to brainstorm how we could continue to support children and families that we normally work with when we couldn't reach them due to physical distancing. Um, we also noticed that there was a real lack of child-friendly resources at the time specific to COVID. Um, they were not immediately implementable by caregivers, what was available, um, not contextualized the way we needed them, not in the languages we needed them. And we also really felt like there was a need to go beyond just sharing information to actually supporting, uh, creating experiences in the home around the, this information. So 
To anchor our work, we started off by creating a, a social emotional learning framework or life skills framework that would guide the specific outcomes that we would be looking for in our work. So you can see here there's five categories and under each category we have noted a skill with a, a child friendly key learning or key message. And this was developed using the information that was available at the time around uh, psychosocial concerns uh, related to COVID-19 and also our own uh, psychosocial well-being framework. So yeah, these has these five themes and the last, uh, so let's stay healthy, let's stay active, let's take care of ourselves, take care of one another. And the last one is specific to parents. Can you switch slides, please? Thank you, great. So these are some examples of what we have done with, uh, with each of those skills. So for every skill, we have drawn from our games database that has over 1300 games to turn them into uh, kind of child facing or parent facing instructions for the games uh, linked to every skill. So we simplified them into three or four steps. Um, so everyone has the theme at the top, the child friendly message, the steps, and then discussion questions to inspire um, more discussion around the lesson in particular and kind of bring that message home. And then finally, in the uh, family category, we've added a link to the tip sheets uh, from the WHO for parents. So we have developed this content that has been actually now also adapted by many of our country teams into different mediums like uh, so this would be like a, what you see here is like an infographic that you could exchange over over social media. Uh, but they've also been converted into videos for social media too, into leaflets and um, radio spots and for television. Um, and um, yeah, I don't want to say any more about the country specific um, adaptations and dissemination. I'm going to leave that to Khalud. So take it away, Khalud. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for being here and, you know, sharing your amazing experiences. And maybe we can share uh, our experience now. Uh, of course, in Palestine, we start working, uh, you know, on what we call data-driven approach. So we start collecting all the data we need in order to uh, be sure that uh, uh, we are filling all the needed, uh, you know, um, uh, what do you call uh, aims and goals by uh, the Ministry of Education and UNRWA. And we are meet. Uh, can you hear me? Because it's, yeah and that we are filling the gaps they are talking about within their plans and strategies all the time. So we started looking on these plans, the emergency plans that have been uh, you know, uh, distributed by the Ministry of Education and UNRWA, and we have started our discussion with our beneficiaries, some of the children, some of the families and coaches and teachers. And I identified these gaps and started working on our resources, what we have. Oh, Khalid, I think we're losing you on the sound. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello. Hi there. You're yeah, back. Sorry You're back. for that. I'm back. Sorry, I'm back. So we started working on all these gaps regarding psychosocial support and well-being and looking at our resources. So we uh, looked at our PSS manuals and we start revising and simplifying all the games that within the resources, which is very important because the simplification is, this is the most important issue, especially for families, because we want them to understand everything is written there. Because usually we do it face-to-face -face training for coaches and teachers, so it wasn't really meant to be for families. So in order for them to understand it, we have to simplify it in very what we call white language. Uh, and maybe if we can see the slide of the card, it's in Arabic. Um, next slide. Yeah. 
So as you can see, we managed to do what we called e-cards, uh, 23 games in the first phase we managed to do. And uh, we compile it in one package. It's, we call the PSS uh, eCards uh, package for uh, families. Uh, and also we managed to finish it and compile it in this one amazing package uh, after consulting with children and uh, families, parents, teachers, uh, especially for the design, for the language, uh, for everything. So they give us a great feedback, you know, until it reach this design you see in front of uh, the screen. Uh, and we have uh, uh, take so many uh, criteria uh, in order to ensure the quality, which is very important. Not only the contribution of beneficiaries for, uh, you know, uh, uh, just in designing and uh, the language. Also, we have, uh, you know, we, we took um, care of uh, gender sensitive also. So the language, as you know, Arabic is very masculine language. So we try to be very gender sensitive regarding this issue and also inclusion. Uh, you can see uh, you only have this one, uh, but we have 23 cards. You can see children with disabilities like in wheelchair and everything. And if you have a look at the, you know, uh, top left, box, you can see that we have uh, merged some kind of guidance for uh, families to ensure the safety of the environment, which is very important, as you know, and the language they have to use with children and to encourage children for discussion, and also the abilities of children. So as you can see, these cards is not only about, you know, uh, just how to play and uh, with very simple, uh, you know, mechanism how to play, but also it ensures everything inclusion, uh, safety of the children, uh, gender sensitive and all of that. And you can see in the bottom, we have a discussion which is very important. Also, it's not only about the game, it's also about life skills. And to ensure that uh, we will reach this point, we have uh, the discussion here. Uh, we have only two main questions and sometimes we have only one main question, which is talking about life skills for children and how we can foster their life skills and their well-being. Uh, they can talk about their feelings, how they are feeling. So it's, it depends on each card because each card is uh, focused in one or two maximum life skills and it's uh, easy. Uh, we have disseminated this with the platform, the Ministry of Education and the emergency cluster here in Palestine. And we got a lot of feedback. We launched it through Facebook and all the uh, social media platforms and still we are engaging uh, with a lot of agencies and with Enerwet too they will try to embed it within uh, the uh, uh, resources they are doing so we're getting a lot of uh, interesting feedback we also developed a key performance indicator to measure you know, the reach and to measure the quality and quantity, which is also very important. As I said, this is only the first phase. We're, uh, it's, it's very simple and it's uh, for ages, we can say between five until 11, 12, but still, of course, everybody can play with that, also us. But we are developing another 20 games, which will be like more complex a little bit, which is very important because some people say uh, we got some feedback and they say it's a little bit so easy. So uh, we're trying to do more complex game for people. Uh, the challenges we are facing, uh, you know, regarding the internet here in Palestine and regarding some people that they don't, do not have, you know, access to remote uh, internet, they don't have internet, don't, don't, don't have smartphone. So this is the good thing about e card that you can really, you need one time access to internet and you can download it and you can play it because it's a whole package and you don't need like, you know, uh, to go again and download, you can just download it once. And also we're starting now to work on interactive posters. And this is very important as you can see, the thing we are concentrating on simplicity, inclusive, gender and also interactive because we do not want to increase burden, you know, on families. And this is what we are getting from uh, like all the families talking about this, that we do not have enough time. The good thing that they can read it just within three to five minutes maximum. They can implement it within 10 minutes up to 15. It's up to you. 
uh, whenever you have time, you can do it. And this is the most amaz amazing thing about these cards. And this is one of the things we are doing and still we are working on the interactive poster with children and we are uh, uh, doing the learning together toolkit, which is uh, uh, it's uh, focused uh, for children and parents interaction and for learning too. And uh, it's a little bit more about academic achievement. And the good thing about all of these cards, you can shift the targets if you want. You know, it's not only we are talking about life skills. If you want it to numeracy or literacy, you can do it both. So this is the good thing. And also you can increase the difficulty of these games upon your need. You can shift the discussion upon your needs so it's a kind of uh, kind of interactive cards let's say and we got a lot of feedback up, uh, on this and it's really encouraging to uh, to continue on that and still we're waiting for you know the second phase and more comments and the challenging we are facing here in palestine and i think everywhere I hope we will manage like to reach, we, we have already reached 20,000, but we hope to reach more with that and to get feedback and, you know, to develop what we are talking about and what we are doing and really enhance the life skills of children in this pandemic, which is very, very important, I think. And thank you for now. Maybe we can start with the video because this video will show us how they are implementing our, at house. Great, thank you. Um, thanks so much, Andrea and Khalid. I'm really conscious of time, Hannah. So perhaps just just playing a few minutes of the video, a few seconds of the video. Great, thanks, Hannah. I think perhaps stop there because we are we are running very low on time. Um, thanks everyone. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Um, Sarah, please do let me know if there's any trouble with my sound. Thank you both. Um, I do want to protect that that discussion time and we are running over. Um, so I'm gonna quickly hand over to Alison who joins us from Plan and perhaps Alison ask if, if you don't mind uh, sticking to, uh, to, to uh, the short time um, that we have. Um, over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. That's fine. I'll definitely try to do that. Um, so good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. And uh, as Charlotte says, I'm representing Plan International, which works in over 50 countries, uh, supporting psychosocial support and social and emotional learning through education, through enhancing life skills with children and young people and focusing on sexual and reproductive health and rights, leadership and economic empowerment. And there's always a particular emphasis, as we've heard from other speakers also, on reducing vulnerability by improving equality for girls and young women. And so, as with every organization, the COVID-19 response is building on this previous experience. At the global level, education program guidance has been developed, um, which in terms of PSS and SEL, includes a focus on ideas for parents to support their children's learning and well-being, along similar lines to what we've been seeing during the school closure period. But the most concrete work is happening through the adaptation of existing approaches and materials, being done at country level and, and regional level also. So I'm going to briefly present a couple of examples of that work. Uh, one from South America, and you can see on the slide there the, the people who've been involved leading it, and one from Lebanon. And I'm happy to have a video uh, from the work uh, in Lebanon. So if we could take to the next, go to the next slide, please. So, in response to this, this current crisis, the Regional Office of the Americas for Plan has developed three educational guides, including the story of Zuri, the little bird you can see at the top there, who with other animal characters must stay at home due to the pandemic. And the guides are designed for children and adolescents between six and 15 years old. And they, they aim to provide a friendly and attractive tool to help transform homes into safe and learning spaces while the families are, are confined, to, confined together. So under the motto, hygiene, calm and care, protective hygiene messages are complemented with activities focusing on social and emotional skills, communication and mathematics. So they're not meant to replace a full school curriculum. We've been hearing about similar approaches, but rather complement what children may already have done in school so that they can be used at any time of the day by children and their parents. 
The materials are framed in the Venezuelan migrant crisis. So the main character, Zuri, is a migrant whose caretakers are of a different species to represent family separation. But the tale doesn't specify the type of family relationship between them, nor Zuri's gender. And reference to the migratory situation itself is minimal. So the story and characters can easily be adapted to any geographic context, whether in South America or in other regions. So the plan is to disseminate this Adventures of Zuri the guides and, and story in print and audiovisual formats, including online and via social media. And concretely, so far, 5,000 guides have been presented and pr printed sorry, for distribution in paper form in Peru and Venezuela. Um, and at the moment, the materials are, are available just in Spanish, but we're very much encouraging their translation into other, other languages and their use by other organizations. So if you would like to know more about that, I think we will see if they can be hosted by INEE. Um, but certainly feel, please feel free to, to contact me directly if, if you are interested in that. And now moving on to the second uh, example, please could you change over the slide and I'm going to hand over to Anna who has pre-recorded a presentation on the work being done in Lebanon. I think we're having trouble with the videos. What I might suggest is that we, given that we're so tight on time, perhaps we can share these videos at the end of the presentations. Um, at the I end can of just the read. I can read what um, was going to be said in that case. Um, so Anna was uh, explaining that she worked as a PSS consultant with Plan International in Lebanon, and within the Plan, the education program there, they they had already produced two manuals, one on self care and one on supporting children, um, and the manuals were created prior to the, to the current uh, COVID situation, um, but are now being adapted. And so to, in, that, in that process, uh, Plan International Lebanon is, is planning remote trainings on the manual content via internet um, for both educational personnel and for um, planned staff in Lebanon. Um, and they're planning also to provide, or, uh, to create audio guides at the manuals, which will later be available online. Um, and in addition, they'll be shooting very short videos with key messages from the content, um, potentially delivered by um, stars from the Lebanese context, uh, and to share those videos online by, and via social media in Lebanon and, and neighboring countries. Um, and so these materials will be available on, on Plan International's website in English and in Arabic, Arabic currently, um, and people are very welcome to, to download them. Um, and uh, just two quick points to make in addition on that, and then I, I've finished, Charlotte. Um, so in terms of psychosocial support from a distance, which I've seen there are a number of questions uh, on in the, in the chat box, um, teachers and other education personnel are being encouraged to make contact with children and their families during the lockdown period by phone um, or, or WhatsApp, whatever is available. Um, and one of PLAN's partner organizations has been recording education and parenting videos, which they've been sending to parents. Um, and plan-supported plan teachers are also being asked to record songs or stories and sending them to families on a regular basis so that, again, parents and children can use them at a distance. Um, and secondly, uh, I see also, and expectedly, there are a lot of questions about measurement of the impact. Um, and indeed, that was planned in the initial uh, program. And now, as it's gone online and remote, uh, there's still plans, there are still plans to um, use satisfaction surveys, which will seek to measure the self-care aspect, the, the manual on um, adult self-care, um, which is, as I say, was being is being delivered by um, distance learning. And there's also an idea to try to simulate some form of assessment by, of the impact on children by teachers, um, potentially through teacher contact um, with families. Um, and so that's building on the, on the original plan, which was to have observation by teachers of children in classrooms. And I think there's, as we've already mentioned, and I see there's a, a mention in the chat there that obviously this situation is temporary. Um, ch children in China are going back to school after three months. So I think we need to be preparing for that. And I think the teacher training that children, teachers will have been able to do online will prepare them and help prepare them for that return to school. And, and um, then those um, assessment and measurement approaches will be able to be put into practice and used um, in, in real time. 
So thank you very much. Thank you to INEE for the uh, opportunity to present here. I look forward to the discussion and please feel free to get in touch if you have questions. Thank you so much, Alison. Apologies around the to challenges with videos. Um, yeah, really powerful points there, particularly around measurement and return to, to school as well. Um, great. Um, Barbara, I'm going to hand straight over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Our, our last panellist, I'm really excited to hear from you and then we'll go into our, our discussion. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, and uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, hopefully healthy, uh, sheltered. <laughs> in place. Um, so uh, my focus uh, is really uh, about taking you to a very local uh, initiative and looking at uh, the advantages of building SEL capacity at the local level uh, in order to be able to uh, respond uh, to a very unusual kind of crisis uh, rather immediately. So I'm welcoming you to the Kakuma Higher Education Space, um, Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya. Uh, it is actually a refugee managed uh, higher education space where youth access higher education and uh, become agents of change in their own communities. So social emotional learning has been an integral part of our higher education space there. Uh, applied arts practitioners have were trained um, ever since 2016 uh, and they share what is being learned in the higher education programs uh, with the community through the arts, uh, through programs that are adapted to different kinds of audiences, whether it's in primary schools, secondary schools or the community uh, as a whole. Sports was actually added only in 2019 and engages both primary school children and uh, youth in, that are enrolled in higher education. Both of these programs empower youth enrolled in higher education programs to drive sustainable community-based SEL models forward. And that allows them to respond effectively in these kinds of sudden onset crises like COVID-19. If we go over to the next slide. Thank you. Um, here is just a very quick overview of uh, you know, the higher education space. We're using critical pedagogy uh, for democratic learning. The students and the teachers design programs for the community and thus, as I said, become the agents of change in their communities and they promote self-reliance. They are the ones who know their communities best. They have their local networks. They design programs that are by definition already contextualized. So what happened with COVID? Um, the SEL team immediately came up with the idea to support a local soap maker who actually also is a student in the higher education space or was a student. They put in extra hours, uh, went to the store, to the production site to fill and label jerry cans full of soap. They then designed, uh, similar to what uh, we've already seen from Right to Play, they designed uh, instructions uh, for sports uh, and for creative arts and play. Uh, they put that on a flyer, laminated the flyer, included uh, instructions for use to how to build a hand washing station made out of a used jerry can. Uh, together with hand washing instructions, uh, they printed it, laminated it and distributed it according to very, very strict distancing rules to over 60 families of the children uh, in two of the primary schools in Kakuma and Kalo Bay settlement. Uh, and those are, were also the children that have been enrolled in our, in our sports program. So uh, enough from me. Uh, I've got uh, two of the managers here who um, I think you know, are better able to explain what they did. And maybe Sarah could play uh, Lamb's contribution and then Grace's and then just turn over uh, the video to the slideshow that shows you how it was all implemented. I think we're going to have the same challenge with the sound. Um, it was working before, but we'll make sure we, we share these presentations afterwards, everyone. I'm sorry, I know these were really powerful videos, so we will find ways to show those. Okay, with the but maybe so the slideshow, I think, doesn't have any uh, that can go without the sound. I mean, the music is not very important. So maybe, Sarah, you can just um, move on to the slideshow up on top.
great and i think i am very conscious of um having some time for discussion um yeah. and as uh, i think it's just a few images that show you how the kids were implementing on uh, the instructions and how they were uh, enjoying, you know, what uh, what the team actually showed them and, uh, you know, how we respected the social distancing rules and how we worked together with UNHCR to make sure that all the instructions actually met, uh, you know, the requirements and were clear and uh, authorized to go out to the families. So with that, yeah, well, I'll welcome. come to the end. Wonderful, really beautiful. So apologies everyone regarding the, the videos. Um, thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you to all our speakers. Really rich um, and diverse mix of, of presentations there. And um, we are short of time, but we do want some discussion. So if I could ask all of the panelists to turn their videos back on, um, we will jump straight in with some questions. As we're doing that, just a, a reminder um, to everyone on the webinar that you can find a lot of the tools and resources mentioned today on the INE website in the COVID-19 collection. If you do have resources you would like to be shared there, please do get in touch. Um, we uh, we uh, yeah, just keen to make sure these useful resources are available. So let's stop sharing the, uh, the presentation and, and have our panelists um, with their video on. And we, we want to start with the first question that is something that we have been asked a lot um, throughout this webinar in advance of the webinar and it relates to measurement. Um, we have heard some great examples of tools and resources related to PSS SCL but I think people are looking for guidance of what measurement looks like at a distance and if any tools and resources are available. Um, I'm really conscious that um, there's a, a measurement library on the INE site with individual and program level measurement and assessment tools related to PSS SCL. They're not specific to COVID-19 but some of them could be adapted so just to mention that resource is there um, but I just wondered Randa if I could come to you just to, to speak to that measurement um, question just for a few seconds thank you um, yeah thanks so much I mean briefly I'll say that while trying to shift your programs or adapt your programs I think uh, measurement is something that's definitely going to be on everyone's mind um, I think what we're trying to focus on right now, at least in the IRC, is um, figuring out ways to monitor who's actually implementing or who's using the resources that we're providing. Um, and we're doing that through um, surveys directly towards uh, families and caregivers. Um, and we're also monitoring um, how many people uh, access the, the, the uh, content database. Um, downloads and viewers and, and, and such. Um, and also for everything that we have video content on uh, YouTube, we can also see the view, the viewership. Um, and then for measurements, I think while we're still adopting programs and we're trying to understand um, um, really which aspects of our programs are going to change, I think that it's, it's, there's no clear answer on one tool or one um, specific tool that I could recommend as a, as, a, as a guidance, but I do recommend looking through the measurement library and seeing if there are any that could be easily adaptable to your program. Thanks, Randa. Um, and I, I just wondered, Marion, if, if you've been having any of these conversations with the MHPSS Collaborative and any, any reflections on measurement from, from your side? Yeah, I think um, like Randa and, and many of you, we're, we're thinking really, trying to think really quickly um, about how we can adapt how we usually monitor and, and measure the impact of our programs in this new context. Um, we're still um, sort of um, working on that, but some of the ideas that we've been exploring with, with colleagues in the MHPSS Collaborative and um, with colleagues within Save the Children who work on um, MEAL, so um, measuring what we're doing, um, we've looked at guidance relating to um, using similar approaches um, to do the programming, to monitor the programming. So where we're using um, telephones to deliver services, we can also use telephones, of course, to monitor um, and trying to um, come up with um, sort of light versions of survey type tools that can be done via telephone is something that, that we're exploring. Um, I know that some are also um, exploring using um, telephones to do um, focus group discussions so having kind of group calls where um, bandwidth or connections allow um, to, to allow us the sort of discussion you would traditionally have in a in a physical um, meeting space um, 
there um there have also been um discussion around using um uh, online forums so that people can log in or contribute their thoughts or feedback whenever they have access um, to online so not you know fixing it at a particular time but just um, being a bit more flexible there um, and some um, you know where um, either where restrictions haven't come in in full force yet or where restrictions are being um, being lifted then how can we you know practice um, safely visiting sites and families um, and doing monitoring that way so kind of looking at all the range of um, of possible um, adaptions and, and trying to, and seeing what works. Great thanks Marianne I think lots of ideas there for, for us to think about. Barbara did you want to jump in I just saw, saw you had a comment about your um, yeah, Strategy. so uh, actually the, the team of, you know, higher education uh, students and managers, uh, we were actually, the soap supply lasts about a month. Uh, it's five liters per family and uh, we're going to go back. Uh, we've, uh, re we've recommended, we've asked them to actually write stories uh, and we'll collect uh, stories and actually tease out some of the themes that come from those stories in order to do some more advanced qualitative um, research on it to see well how has that intervention that is very local was locally produced and implemented um, what what kind of impact did it have on the children and what did it mean uh, for them so it's also the students that are producing this because the team's also been um, uh, trained in participatory action research methods so they are they are very 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 keen now to see, okay, how, how, how can we really, you know, go full circle and after a month when the supply, uh, you know, is finished, then, you know, we'll see what, uh, what has happened. Thanks, Barbara. Great. And as this seems like such a, an important but challenging um, question for everyone at the moment, perhaps we as the IE community can come back to that and perhaps either in a follow-up webinar or part of our blog series, um, try and capture some more of these, these ideas. Um, thank you for those reflections. Um, we are also, and Marion, just to come back to you, we've had quest, quite a few questions around guidance about children who need more specialised support. And I know you touched on that in your um, presentation. I just wondered if there's anything you'd add. I know concerns that existing referral pathways and case management systems might not be um, possible. So just any, any thoughts, particularly as we think about how we might collaborate with, with other sectors. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's so important. And on our on our guidance, we've left a space because obviously um, it's not something that those of us working at the global level, we don't know what the referral pathways are in particular communities or in particular contexts. So it's really um, that's one way that these tools and messages need to be, you know, contextualized um, and uh, linking up um, the kinds of materials that we're sharing as education actors to the services that are provided by child protection actors um, if available if not available what other community supports might there be that um, we could encourage and signpost parents um, parents to access and I'd be really interested to hear and it, it might be something that I need could look at in future is what role can teachers also play in continuing to, continuing to support and and link um, parents and caregivers and children up to um, the services that, that may exist, um, both within you know, communities, whether that's um, religious leaders or other um, community support services or social workers or, um, or other health um, facilities that, that might be there um, and available. And I think that would be, it'd be really interesting to think through um, how we can use the capacity that teachers have to, to help make those linkages. It's something that we do sometimes anyway Anyway, in emergencies um, but in this COVID context where teachers aren't physically together with children do they still have a role to play and how can we you know use their their strengths and their um, yeah their capacities. Great thanks Marion. Um, we've had um, a few questions around um, strategies to support parent and teacher well-being just to um, let everyone know that we do have a recording of, of our webinar that did focus more on that but Alison I don't know if you had any thoughts from from plan side about how you're sort of supporting parents own well-being and caregivers at this time um, well as I as I described I think the the most important point is, is keeping in touch with parents as far as possible. So what we've been emphasizing with co our colleagues in countries is 
the importance of keeping those telephone communications open, for example. Um, and sometimes that could be directly with individual parents, maybe through teachers uh, connecting to families or potentially through uh, school management committees and other community leaders with whom the projects will already have, uh, will have, have existing connections that they can use. Um, and then, I mean, I think we've been struggling with the same challenges that everyone's been describing about how do you actually reach those parents. And so, um, as I described, we, we, there are some materials that have been developed and some also at the global level to give the kinds of messaging that um, Marion in particular described. Um, so those are, the, those are the lines along which we're going at the moment. But uh, as I think in most cases, we're not yet in a position to say what's worked and what, what hasn't, but we're hoping very much to, Indeed, as Marion was just saying there, keep in touch with our colleagues in countries to find out what they're able to learn from those, keeping those connections open and, and try to make sure that we're documenting that. And I think the connection with protection colleagues is particularly important because, of course, one of the earlier speakers mentioned how schools can be safer places than homes for children, um, and particularly for girls in, in some contexts. And um, we want to try to make sure that we're monitoring um, abuses of children etc through through our protection colleagues to see whether in fact we are managing to have the impact that we're hoping to through these messages through the messaging that we're doing great thanks Alison everyone I'm very conscious that we have run out of time and there is a lot more to talk about in this topic um, we will develop an FAQ document based on the questions that have been raised a few people have asked about principles to keep in mind when we're thinking about reopening and restarting schools and I would have love to have heard from um, our colleagues in Afghanistan and in and Palestine from their reflections on that um, but perhaps we could collect those in an FAQ document and share that with the recording um, afterwards. I just want to again reiterate a huge thanks for our panellists and our participants for joining us today. I hope there's been a, a kind of a rich discussion for you there for, to find some useful takeaways as well as key resources. We will be, our webinar next week will focus on support to teachers, so we'll touch on some of these issues um, and our webinar the week after that will focus on some of the, the questions around inclusion which also came up today um, in inclusive education. So we'll send details of those um, out to you very soon. Um, but given the interest of time, um, I think we are going to have to, to draw things to a close. So just to thank everyone for joining us today and for your continued commitment um, to try to continue education in these already challenging um, circumstances which are now even more complex so we really appreciate everything you're doing please don't hesitate to get in touch with us if there is anything you feel that we can be doing to support your work either ideas for webinars resources for the website um, just do get in touch but I'll, I'll thank everyone um, for joining us today and, and end the webinar there we'll uh, connect with you all again soon <clears throat>